Let me then uh, turn to Elaine Scarry. Uh, Elaine teaches at Harvard University, where she is the Cabot Professor of Aesthetics. Among her works is Thermonuclear Monarchy, which demonstrates that nuclear weapons and democratic governance are mutually exclusive. Beyond demonstrating the extraordinary dangers of first strike nuclear uh, doctrines uh, and, uh, and that the nine nuclear monarchs uh, hold the fate of humanity uh, in their hands, she also maintains that they have the political tools needed to dismantle their country's nuclear architecture, and they also have the obligation to do so. Elaine has been elected to the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received numerous honors and awards and was named as one of the top 100 leading U.S. intellectuals. No captive of the ivory tower, Elaine serves on the board of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, and she is very active with the Massachusetts Peace Action's Nuclear Disarmament Working Group. Elaine, thank you for all that you do, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Kevin, and fellow speakers, and to all of you who are participating. I want tonight to devote my 10 minutes to just describing the response to deterrence by General Lee Butler, who, as you probably know, is the former commander in chief of the United States, <clears throat> United States Strategic Command. In addition to being commander in chief of the United States Strategic Command, General Butler was director of the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff. So his voice is one that's coming to us from the deep interior of our country's nuclear architecture. For example, in the year the Berlin Wall fell, his particular job was to serve as director for strategic planning in the office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this is somebody who could be crowing about his success in overseeing uh, nuclear deterrence. And instead, what he gives us is an impassioned denunciation of deterrence theory. Uh, General Butler says that deterrence, nuclear deterrence is premised on a litany of unwarranted assumptions, unprovable assertions, and logical contradictions. He identifies, as I see it, eight flaws in the mindset of deterrence. Number one is the fact that deterrence contradicts the first obligation of the military and the first obligation of national security which is to ensure the survival of the nation. He doesn't just say that they don't live up to that. He says that they starkly contradict it. Uh, and I, it leads him to say that it's our greatest responsibility to rethink nuclear deterrence. The second flaw is the fact that, uh, that nuclear deterrence is fatally flawed on the level of human psychology. He says that it's premised on the idea that each side can understand the position of the others. And yet in reality, each has very little understanding and in many cases makes very little even attempt to understand what the other side is doing and saying. He deplores the fact that we take Western reasoning and rationality as a model for a situation that is hideously complex and terrifying and gives rise to uh, all kinds of panic and, uh, and, and fear. Um, now, it's, it's the case that, that one of the leading proponents of nuclear deterrence theory, uh, Thomas Schelling, um, points out that, that uh, deterrence is often wrongly accused, in his view, wrongly accused of being hyper-rational. And yet, when you listen to Thomas Schelling's often very brilliant interviews on YouTube, you see that each time somebody presents him with a scenario that could entail the breakdown of deterrence theory, he says, but that would be foolish, or but that would mean that people had misperceived one another. Um, and, and, uh, and yet that's exactly what happens in the fog of war. People do misconstrue others' intentions. Number three in uh, General Butler's uh, denunciation is a, de a flaw in deterrence theory that um, comes from the fact that if it fails, um, it's, it, the consequences of that failure are intolerable. General Butler says that in conventional war, 
if uh, deterrence fails, there, you will, of course, suffer. You may lose a battle. You may lose the war. Um, you, you may have your country uh, change governance. But you don't have what you have if deterrence fails. And that is that uh, the whole earth, he says, is poisoned and inhabitants are deformed from generation to generation. Not only the fate of nations, but the very meaning of civilization, he writes, are, are in jeopardy. I think that his point here is very clarified by an observation made by a sociologist at Yale named Charles Perrault, who points out that every device, every object, every process in the world has some moment in which it will break down, even if only for a short time. And therefore, what you don't want is any object or any device or any process that in the event that it breaks down is going to be catastrophic. And exactly what nuclear deterrence uh, is, is a process that if it breaks down is going to be utterly um, fatal. Um, the fourth flaw in the uh, in deterrence theory is the fact that uh, there's a, a tremendous contradiction at its heart. Uh, General Butler says that deterrence relies on the specter of a huge second strike. If my opponent wants to use a first strike against me, he will be discouraged when he sees that even after that strike, I have an arsenal that can deliver massive retaliation, or at least retaliation far beyond uh, what is, was suffered. But here is the contradiction. To my opponent, this mighty second strike arsenal that I've amassed looks an awful lot like a first strike arsenal. And fearing that I might deliver a massive first strike, um, my opponent now has to vastly increase their own second strike uh, uh, arsenal, which looks to me like a first strike arsenal. And so the very point of deterrence, which was to dissuade people from first use by showing the strength of second use, um, turns over in a somersault and just gravitates once more towards, um, towards first use. It also has another consequence, consequence, which leads directly to the fifth law, and that is that it, uh, it accelerates, it, uh, it, it increases the uh, composition of US and Soviet forces and the forces of other nuclear states. That is rather than placing rational limits on for nuclear forces, it gives rise to an insatiable arms race. Now, General Butler repeatedly calls out the greed and obscene appetite of weapons contractors. And he also remarks on the competition between Navy and Air Force for which one will get to be preeminent in the nuclear array. He also shows that what proliferates are bureaucracies and processes. He writes that there are astronomically expensive infrastructures, monolithic bureaucracies, and complex processes, which just defy one's comprehension. Um, to enhance rather than constrain application is the outcome of nuclear deterrence. And he says that as he witnessed weapon after weapon being contemplated through every corridor, and now I'm quoting, through every corridor, in every impassioned plea, in every fevered debate about a given weapon, rang the rallying cry, deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. So the drive for new weapons, again, comes from greed, comes from competition, comes from the uh, wish to create ever more ingenious forms of massacre, but it also comes from that paradox between first use and second use that I described earlier. The sixth flaw is the profound moral aberration of deterrence. Uh, General Butler points out that it can't possibly be legitimate and appropriate to respond to a nuclear weapon by then launching a nuclear weapon at the uh, opponent's population. What target, he writes, could warrant such retaliation? Would we hold an entire society accountable for the decision of a single demented leader? Closely related to this sixth law is a seventh law. Deterrence destroys the ability of both individuals and groups to think clearly. Um, he says that 
Deterrence theory and game theory are made up of rhetorical parlor tricks and verbal sleights of hand that disable our ability to think. They corrode our sense of humanity, numb our capacity for moral outrage, and make thinkable the unimaginable. That's their effect on individuals who keep bandying the term deterrence about. But it also uh, harms planners who should be using their mental abilities to scrutinize situations, uh, to debate, to deliberate, and instead are in this, uh, what one philosopher describes as tit, to tit for tat game of uh, deterrence. The eighth flaw is the one that Tad mentioned at the very opening of his talk, namely deterrence theory promotes, promotes pro proliferation internationally. If we think deterrence makes the world safer, then many other countries should adopt it as well. Gen General Butler says, while we continue to espouse nuclear deterrence and to celebrate it as an irreplaceable element in our security, other nations are listening and are being converted to our theology. So General Butler describes deterrence as a framework that prepares the way for apocalypse. It must be challenged, it must be refuted, he says, but most important, it must be let go. Thank you.